We're recording this on September 13th, 1996. I'm Larry Walker from the Broadcast Department of the University of Nebraska Lincoln. We're talking with Ken Elkins, who's president of Pulitzer Broadcasting. We're talking about uh, the issue in terms of broadcasting and the historical aspects of it Ken knows about in Nebraska broadcasting. First, Ken, how'd you, how'd you get into broadcasting? Long story, Larry. I, I mean, it is Friday the 13th, so I assume we'll have to be careful, but long story, uh, I began here uh, late, I guess late 50s uh, in the engineering department uh, at an entry-level job. Uh, worked in several different capacities in the engineering department. Uh, eventually named chief engineer. Uh, subsequently went to uh, Dubuque, Iowa, where in 1970, four of us built a complete television station in 90 days. Uh, returned to KETV in approximately two years uh, from when I originally left. Uh, then moved into the, as the operations area, then moved into the sales department, from there into the general manager's job, uh, and all other jobs in between. Now, when did you, uh, when did you come back to Omaha, 1972? Okay, and when did, when did you become the general manager? 1975. Okay. When did Pulitzer buy the company? 1980. And what, what was your position with the Pulitzer? I was the general manager when Pulitzer purchased the station. Uh, Talk about Channel 7 in the 1970s. Well, Channel 7 in the night was an interesting issue. Uh, we had the smallest staff. Uh, we had the newest network. We had the smallest, in, at least with respect to time, news commitment. Uh, news at Channel 7 began, as I recall, at 9.30 and lasted for five minutes. Uh, and it was, uh, ABC was a brand new and really certainly didn't enjoy even close to the prominence that it enjoys today. Uh, it was a beginning. Uh, equipment by any standard was archaic. It was huge. Uh, we would do film, initially in black and white, uh, subsequently of converting to color and all the problems that color would create in terms of trying to get the film clips to appear to be the same. Uh, so it was wonderfully exciting in 19, uh, the early, early 60s as, as it is today. Now I remember a, a story that uh, when you were in the technical side of the operation that uh, you helped build a switcher as I recall. Tell me a little bit about that. Well we actually did. It uh, probably confused a lot of people but it was a a reed relay cross point switcher and we were attempting to get it to switch with, during the vertical interval which is now a walk in the park and it was all handmade. Uh, matter of fact much of the equipment was handmade. We built a great deal of the terminal equipment. We built the switching equipment. I, it was actually used for several years. I, I, I don't remember the exact number but six or seven years we, we actually used it to, to switch wrestling live out of Studio B which is our hopefully our new newsroom uh, within a couple weeks. What, uh, what was the, uh, the budget like for equipment in those days? I, I really wasn't in the mainstream of, of the budget. But Who owned the station? We were a, a subsidiary of the Herald Corporation. We were called the Herald Corporation, which was a subsidiary of the, uh, of the Omaha World Herald. Uh, pretty much as a lot of newspaper uh, owners did at that time, television was so new and uh, very little was expected uh, and it was a, a compliment to uh, to the newspaper side to have both newspaper and television in the same month. Who was the manager of Channel 7 when you first came to, the, to work as an entry-level guy? Eugene Thomas. And how long did he continue to be the manager? For some period of time, I don't remember the years, but uh, uh, for a period of time, I'm going to say several years, his, his uh, successor was a man by the name of Ken James. And then I think me, I think I was the third general manager in, in the station. Uh, and since then there's been a couple more, but I think I was the third. When, when you had the opportunity to go to Dubuque, why did you leave Channel 7? Well, it was, uh, it was an opportunity to, uh, if you describe building a television set at a station at that stage of our life, it was like a kid with a big erector set, uh, and it was all brand new, and it was it was UHF, and it was uh, 
like any type of growth opportunity a person has, you, uh, you sometimes take advantage of those particular opportunities. So it was a terrific experience. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I would probably do it again today given the opportunity uh, because as, as you go through your life, your responsibilities change, and, and, but you, you can look back with some fondness at all the other opportunities you had and, the, and how effective you were or were not uh, during the time. But uh, it was terrific. It was a great experience, uh, and it was, UHF was, was almost non-existent at that time. And we built the station on Channel 40, and Channel 40's propagation is different than Channel 7's in that uh, it, would, it would do weird things. As a matter of fact, in one town, we completely missed the signal went right over the town. So that was an interesting time in our life. Why did you decide to come back to Omaha? Well, I, I wanted to, uh, I thought there was a growth opportunity at the station in, in terms of the operations department. I thought it would for me personally, having more of a technical background than others, I, it was a better opportunity in Omaha to, to eventually work yourself into the sales department, which I did. That's always a kind of an interesting situation because people who have technical background, who have worked, who have built switchers and so forth, don't often want to get into sales. Why did you want to get into sales? Well, you go through you go through life thinking you have to take advantage of every opportunity you get, uh, and. Uh, either being dumb or smart, I don't know which, but uh, we, uh, it's a growth opportunity, so it's just something you don't pass. It's not very, not very rational, is it? <laughs> but that the opportunity was something that was probably a good credential when you were considered for the position of being the, the general manager. Oh, I, don't, I don't think it would be possible, or would not have been possible at that time to not have a, and as it is today, to have a a rather significant experience in sales in order to make the business function because nothing really functions unless you can effectively sell the advertising and create the cash requirements of both shareholders and, and uh, in this case, private owners. Now, you talked about the um, ABC network not being particularly a big force when you first started with the station, but in the late 70s when you were the general manager, it began to to be a force and begin to come into his own. It a, a significant that. force in terms of entertainment programming. It took longer for it to become a factor in news. Uh, but we, we even in the early years, had a very strong uh, young demographic appeal versus, so we may or may not have won the news battle early on, but we have for years won the demographic battle. And as of today, there's a current skew more to NBC than to ABC, so we're feeling the effects of that not only in the uh, prime time programming, but also in the news programming. You were a pretty young guy to get to be the general manager of a television station in Omaha, Nebraska. Who made the decision to, to give you that opportunity? Ken James. Why? I'm not sure. You never know why people make decisions. I often say that the biggest meetings about you in your life you don't attend. And I think this is an example of... Uh, you know, why people reach conclusions about others, I think, very difficult. Uh, I, you know, I've always, I've always been committed, I think. Uh, uh, I've been pretty persistent, I would, I would believe. And I think that some people see that, and, and you, for one reason or another, get an opportunity. And it's conceivable I was the only choice. So uh, if I was the only choice, I'm grateful for that. About the same time, you became prominent in the Nebraska Broadcasters Association as a board member and an officer and president and so forth. Uh, what, uh, what led you into being interested in the professional uh, opportunities well, there? We had a, in my judgment, a fantastic executive director at that time. He was a, an institution in Omaha Television. His name was Frank Fogarty, who was a terrific uh, gentleman who was subsequently deceased. Uh, he, as I recall, along with you, uh, suggested that I should participate. And I do think that television has an awesome responsibility in and today as it did at its inception uh, to community service and doing good news and, uh, and Nebraska Broadcaster trying to create a forum for doing that and at the same time uh, trying to have an impact with the legislature uh, in, in terms of interests that we may or may not have with, with a certain le legislation. Uh, it was a terrific experience. What was the company's attitude towards your participation as, a, as a really a very visible leader in broadcasting at that point? I think I've been very fortunate in all the companies for which I've worked. There, there's always been a terrific support uh, 
to, to do not only the you know the daily assignments of your and, and to try to deal with your routine responsibilities, but also the responsibility that is broader, and that's to make the business better, to make the communities better, and hopefully. Uh, at the end of the day, you provided a greater service, and, and if you got lucky, you may have benefited someone. Talk a little bit more about Frank Fogarty and his uh, role uh, helping you as the uh, as the guy who was well, the day to day guy for the association. Frank was unusual. I remember when we uh, toward uh, the end of the time when we started t taking Frank to uh, to the uh, meetings because he was unable to drive. He was truly a committed broadcaster, in my judgment. He worked for the Meredith Company. Uh, I think it was Meredith at the time, uh, for a long period of time. He had, he was also, he was, he was nationally known uh, as a, you know, I think in many facets of broadcasters of being a very sincere and committed broadcaster, a very principled individual. And uh, so we, it just seemed to work, if, if, that, if that makes sense and that's reasonable, that uh, uh, Frank was a terrific influence, I think, on many of us. Frank tended to, uh, to uh, identify with people he thought were up-and-coming people, and he identified you as that kind of person to pull into the association. Well, I don't know why, but I think that's accurate, yes. <laughs> how, did, how, did you, uh, how did you see your role in the association in terms of the kinds of things that, that came your way when you were on the board or when you were uh, I, I a president? I don't recall any of the specific issues because, as you know, in our business, there is a, a major issue that comes up at least annually. But I'm certain it would probably have been a sales tax issue on advertising. Uh, would have been something along uh, that or in that arena uh, that we didn't think was appropriate for us, and they thought, of course, would be appropriate for the state. Now you you served as president of the association between uh, a man named Richard Chapin, who, who then was at the Stewart Stations in in uh, Lincoln, and who had also served as president at an earlier time. In the meantime, had been prominent uh, in the NAB and. and and following you was a man named Lee Hall, who was a guy from Shadron, Nebraska right. at that point, which is quite a diverse kind of situation. Right. How did you see yourself as the big town television guy between the, the guy with the national well, reputation, the radio group, and the small town western guy? I, I don't think the television uh, in Omaha was necessarily bigger than Dick Chapin uh, in, uh, as a, who's, I think is still currently a, a major representative of the business, principally in radio, not in television. And. And Lee, I think that's what makes, to a great extent, Nebraska unique in that you know, the demands and needs and the service requirements of any media operation vary so much between market size. Uh, and Omaha being the principal area of the state, I guess one would expect us to be a little more sophisticated. Whether we're not, were or not, is I'm uncertain. When you were in Omaha, there was a, a, an issue with it. Cable television was was going to come to Omaha, but it wasn't coming right away. What do you recall in terms of the positions of the stations about uh, the, the delay of cable television? I don't recall that as being a, an issue of significance to us. Uh, uh, personally, I've always believed that uh, a television over the air has a, a much higher quality than television on cable. And, uh, I think the cable television folks have been very effective in, in, with the elimination of ghosts of selling a product. And of course, the number of program services is very, very limited, certainly by today's standards. Uh, I don't recall a, it being a factor uh, in terms of development, except that as our quality was by marginal at that time, I would, I would think that their quality would have also been marginal. But I don't really re know exactly when cable was introduced into the market. What's, what's the level of uh, competition in, in television in, in the 70s in Omaha? Competition in Omaha is, has always been, to my recollection, a very, very serious. Uh, the uh, WWT is, has, during Frank's tenure and, and many others, uh, really led this marketplace for a great number of years in terms of uh, perception of commitment and quality and competence. We got into the game late, and KM, KMTV, uh, and as you know, Omaha has uh, produced a lot of national figures of prominence in the broadcasting business. Uh, I guess beginning with Johnny Carson, everyone knows about that, but uh, Floyd Calver, uh, John Coleman, and uh, we could go on, but a, a, a lot of people came out of the Midwest and went on to do bigger and better things in the broadcast business. I uh, 
uh, I think the competition then is no different than today. The sophistication is different, but the sincerity of the of everyone in Omaha to do the best job at all three, or I guess we'd now say four, of the broadcast facilities is still as significant as it was 25 years ago. Because you know a lot about the bottom line these days. What was the pressure on the bottom line when you were just starting in the sales area in the general manager's position in the 70s as compared to uh, into more recent times? Well, uh, as you know, television has, for the most part, always been a very attractive business. Uh, but the business is fundamentally driven by how successful or effective you can be in the marketplace and whether or not you can, in fact, uh, attract the greatest number of viewers. I don't recall, uh, you know, early on much discussion of any about the bottom line. I'm not sure I've known what it was or cared at the time. But you do, over the years, learn how to count. So it becomes an issue. Uh, uh, and I think that that's, that is maybe what is most significant uh, in in dealing with both current and former issues, and that is that your bottom line will be the best when you are perceived as being the best community servant. What's coming from a technical background that's been helpful to you in terms of your position in management? Well, I think the technical department is uh, generally understated for its contribution to the broadcast station. Uh, it's a group of folks who work very hard every day doing things that others don't understand and never see. And I think the uh, none of the things that you see that appear to be very routine on your television set are routine. The, it takes a great deal of work, time, and energy, and intelligence to do the technical side. And then technical people, I think, are generally more logical uh, in that things have to happen in a given process. So if you don't if you don't do it kind of A, B, C, D, it, you, you don't end up with the desired result. So uh, it, uh, whether others would agree if you're logical or not, I, I think it does create some logic in your mind. And then it's very helpful then when I'm reviewing capital equipment to have some understanding of the application where I think most television managers, the that side of the business is absolutely foreign. They don't understand it, and, and they don't want to understand it, and it's not likely they will ever understand it, but it's a very significant part of the broadcast business. Could create more exposure for the company from a legal perspective, particularly FCC, uh, than most anything else we do. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so you have to have very competent technical people committed to doing the same job. It's a wonderful phenomenon in television about how, having these distinct personalities that you have to commingle in some form and, and hopefully create a team because it comes from just different and diverse positions. But the technical operation is as significant as anything else in the television station and in my judgment is not perceived uh, in many stations on the, at the same level of, of, of ability or contribution. A few moments ago you talked about um, the um, technical operation as you started out in the business and then a little later we talked about community involvement, how the television station gets imbued with the community spirit and, and, and the Broadcasters Association and so forth. Where in your career do you feel that you picked up that feeling of the station in the community? Well, probably very early on. I think, uh, I think the whole issue of, of community service or being responsible or responsive to other people it has probably been basic since I was being a, a small child. Uh, but uh, when you get into a position to be able to affect that, those kinds of issues and where you can make a contribution, KETV has been particularly fortunate in having a person by the name of Betty Denty, who, Denny, who over the years, I think, has that belief that our responsibility of community service is significant. Not because it's a mandate of the FCC, but because it's an important part. Uh, uh, there, there's no question that Broadcasting how it has the loudest media voice in any town, and the responsibilities there then become greater. So uh, it uh, gives you an opportunity to do it. You feel good about it if you do it well. And it goes to so many areas of uh, broadcasting today. Uh, you know, we go back when we really were, I think, unquestionably, even though we may have been third in the ratings, we were unquestionably, in my mind, the first in weather. We created the weather watchers going when we used to go out west and watch those tornadoes come through. Uh, and that, in effect, is a wonderful community service. 
Uh, and uh, we have, I think, many times been responsible for saving lives, which is great. And I think we continue to do that. Uh, but I do think we were uh, well on the leading edge of that curve early on. And, and, but today, I think that everyone has, has certainly the same objective. Ken, let's uh, kind of look at this in a different way, but thinking the position of Mr. Thomas, Mr. James, your predecessors, the general manager of Channel 7, some people think that the personality or the perceptions or the ideas of the general manager is reflected in the way that the station operates. What do you think of that? Oh, I, I think that's true. A wise man once said the odor from a snake emanates from the head. I think uh, there's no question uh, if you're going to be committed and you're sincere, you'll have an impact. It can be good or bad, but you can have an impact on the overall results of the station. You certainly have an impact on how it operates. You, you, you do set the tone, I think, uh, and hope you set a good tone. You do set the tone of how you want the station to function. When the station was owned by the Herald Corporation, how much uh, information came from, the, from people outside the, the KETV structure to the people? I, I recall very little, if any. Uh, the liaison between the, uh, I guess, the parent company and the and the subsidiary, which was KET, was Ben Cowdery. Uh, and uh, so at, at that stage, I had little relationship with him. I did have a relationship once I was named general manager. But, but in terms of the criticism that one would expect that the newspaper or the broadcast station, one or the other, controls the news, that goes back to the issue of cross-ownership and whether it was good to have newspaper television ownership in the same market. I've never had the experience of a either currently or in my position here at KETV where I was, where someone has ever called and told me what to do or not to do in news. What do you think the, what other kinds of things that the general manager's personality might have something to do with the way well, the yeah, station goes? We hope they have the ability to create an enthusiasm and an excitement and that they really do enjoy coming to work and it's a, it is a wonderfully exciting business and it's as exciting today as it was 30 years ago. And you hope that that's contagious and then the other members of the staff in the station, you know, pick up the same level of enthusiasm. Not that it's always smooth, you know, it's, that's just not business. You know, you sometimes have differences of opinion. You're going to have, you sometimes get in, into negotiations where everyone in the room doesn't have a complete picture and it's hard to have a communication because the assumptions are made that may or not be accurate. But uh, it's, it's enthusiasm, excitement, I think, wins over time. And a really a an absolute responsibility, integrity, and fairness. Sometimes what's really exciting, the way business operates, is when you're the general manager and the station gets sold. And uh, that happened to you. Uh, right. You were sold to the Herald Corporation and the Pulitzer Corporation. Talk, well, about, I, talk uh, about that. Well, I was, uh, uh, my <coughs> supervisor was a man by the name of Hod Grahams that I had never met. And of course, I had never met the Pulitzer Company. This is when the Pulitzer Company bought Channel bought, 7. Yes, in 1975. Already. I was the general manager. And it was, Typical then that, uh, and maybe even today, although I don't do it, that when a, you know, a new broom sweeps clean. Uh, so I figured that one of the best ways to you know, maybe retain your job was just to double the cash flow. So that's what I did. And and this led you to the opportunity to do some other things with PLS Broadcasting. Well, then I was I did uh, KETV. I was the general manager for five years, and uh, once I survived that hurdle and I was retained, then I was called to. Uh, to come to St. Louis and see if I would run the NBC station in St. Louis. Was it hard to uh, pick up and leave Omaha? After all, you'd been here for a while. Your, your family was pretty it well was, uh, here. It was easier for me than it was for my family. My, it was a terribly disruptive issue for my family. And But life, since life is a learning experience, that you, and it's important for people in positions like mine to have had the experience, uh, moving is not easy. Of course, they'd all been to Dubuque, right? They'd been to the big, but they surely don't want to leave, leave Omaha. They were all in school here, and they, uh, and my wife was a native Iowan, and she was, uh, and her parents were here. And uh, but I think the difference is that certainly at that stage of our lives, that uh, you know you can go to work in Omaha as a man on Friday, and in St. Louis on Monday, and it really is not material, but it is certainly different for your family. So, uh, you know, the kids were, I have two kids, and three grandkids. Uh, they were for the most part grown, and so I said, well, it's another opportunity, so off I go. <laughs> and what was the position in St. Louis that, that you I went down there as general manager. Uh, and with the station call letters at the time? KSD. 
Uh, historic coal miners. Historic. One of the early stations east of the or west of the Mississippi in television. Owned by the, I think, the world's most respected uh, newspaper journalist. Uh, people of terrific character and integrity. Uh, we were able to, uh, at Channel 5 in St. Louis, it was, uh, I guess the shock or the experience was, you know, when you're, like television is today as it was then, a move into a bigger market is supposed to be a move into a more professional circumstance. Well, it wasn't even close to true in, in moving to St. Louis. That was, uh, it was not a good news operation. It was, uh, the business was being driven just by the strength of the broadcast business. Uh, I probably had a great deal more respect for the efforts made at, KS at KETV in, in Omaha than I'd, after the experience at uh, KSD in St. Louis. And there, immediately after that, which wasn't too long, they, just, they also sold the station in St. Louis to uh, uh, eliminate a, the perception of a, a long-term problem with cross ownership. They owned the newspaper, radio, and television in St. Louis. And even though those issues had been grandfathered, uh, the ownership of the company felt there could be some risk to retaining the ownership. So it, there was an election made to trade KSD for uh, two, te two television stations in the Carolinas, the NBC station in Winston-Salem and, and the NBC station in Greenville. But you didn't leave St. Louis. Well, in that time, they asked me to do another job. Uh, they said, uh, they asked me if I would run the company. Todd Grams is retiring. Todd soon. Grams has retired. They have named the successor to Todd Grams. His name is Ray Carpwitz. And then uh, circumstance developed there which, for which I'm not totally familiar. But then they asked me if I would run the company. And uh, I said, well, why not? So I did What that. year is this? 1982. So your, your time from leaving Omaha until you're running the company is rather short time. Yes. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's a short time. Still a pretty young guy to be moving up to the next job. I suppose. Okay. What was, what was PLS Broadcasting like? What were the holdings like in 82 compared to more recent times? Uh, small. Uh, the company has grown remarkably. We're up to uh, nine television stations and two radio stations. We've never sold a station that uh, we didn't have to. Uh, in terms of cross ownership, with maybe the slight exception of Fort Wayne, Indiana. And in effect, you offered more money, you'd pay for it, so we elected to sell that. And we moved all that money into a station in New Orleans. But it was uh, KETV at KOAT and uh, I think uh, KSD. I'm not exactly certain when Pennsylvania came online, but something in there is much smaller. What's the difference between running? the station in Omaha, the station in St. Louis, and running the group? Probably more fun. Uh, it, it's, uh, initially, it, there is some frustration about being out of the mainstream of the television station, but responsibilities change and your life changes. But the first couple of weeks of being in a corporate office without, without all the, the noises of television made you think it passed the far, you know, to the beyond. But uh, once we overcame that, then people in positions like mine can be very effective if, if they understand the, the television station and they have a responsible ownership and, and hopefully moving the station forward. And I've been very fortunate in that regard. So the responsibilities differ, uh, but you still have a, you can have a close contact with the station. The art is when are you meddling and when are you managing? And that's a, sometimes not an easy challenge to meet. As we continue, Ken, let's talk a little bit about the, the period and, and near the end of your time in Omaha when you were president of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association and, and the, the legendary Frank Fogarty, the man that you alluded to several times, uh, who had been really uh, a, a major player in broadcasting had become executive director of the association and, and in his retirement years was not in particularly good health and, and began to phase out at that point, decided to retire from that position. And uh, you were president of the association at the time when you had to change executive directors, which right. is a, a time when all presidents really fear the job, I guess. Right. Talk a little bit about what happened. Well, it's interesting because we didn't pay them any money. And this is maybe still true in America. You're trying to get the best for nothing. Uh, and uh, we, the, the challenge of getting someone, it was uh, an issue. We, we weren't certain whether it was a full-time job or a part-time job or an, a, a non-job. But uh, 
we went through the process, the screening process, a number of us, and tried to come up with a candidate we thought could replace Frank, knowing there was big shoes to fill, uh, and we did. Uh, we hired uh, the former mayor. Uh, and I, I don't recall his, what was his position at, uh, do you remember? The, uh, well, then he, was a, he wasn't actually the mayor yet not, at that point, no. but he was a person who had been quite mm -hmm. visible in terms of in the community. Things, yeah. right. And, but one of the issues was, was he, was he too visible, I think, in terms of that? Right. And, and you uh, took the leadership role in terms of interviewing him. And, and we, we eventually did hire him. Uh, and I'm not sure what happened because it was during, that, during his tenure that I left and went to St. Louis. Then he decided to go run for mayor after that right. and, and went on after. A, right. In fact, it became fairly interesting because a number of those people, Frank Fogarty, if you recall, was an elected member, I think, of the OPPD board. Right. And so several of those people went on to elective positions, like Charles Stone, who went on to be a congressman and governor and so forth, and became right. an interesting sort of stepping stone in, in, a, in an odd way to do that. Well, what, uh, when, when you were in that kind of a position, you were looking at Mike Boyle, and you, you, people in Omaha knew him better than other folks did. Why did he seem to be a good candidate? Well, I, I don't recall the exact specifics as to why he was a good candidate, uh, because it was difficult to get... Uh, a person with all the experiences that you were, you were looking to uh, and still get it for nothing. I don't recall what the rate was, but it was embarrassing. Well, it probably still is uh, in terms of compensation. But w it was a consensus that he was the best candidate of the group uh, and I think was effective, Not as a, probably not as effective with Frank, as Frank, but he was effective. What does, um, what does the, the role of, um, you, you've had the opportunity to do a lot with professional associations, with affiliate groups, and so forth. And you might track through a little bit of those kinds of opportunities that you've had and talk about the role of leadership that you can exert in those kinds of situations. Well, it's interesting because it's uh, trade associations do not function as boards of directors. Therefore, it's a, it's a marketing challenge to try to, to gain a point of view or to get the perspective on a particular issue that you would like. Uh, so it, that becomes a challenge, much more of a, I don't want to say politician, but, but particularly a, an effective way of communicating without authority, where you know, much of your business experience, you, you really have had the authority to affect change if you so desire. And it becomes a, you get a better, I think, posture of uh, understanding with other people because even though you think it's very clear to you and no one could possibly disagree, there are hundreds that will. So I think that probably is the challenge of most trade organizations and that is to try to effectively, effectively represent their membership uh, and eliminate all the biases that are just attended to, to that many people of, of particular desires. Uh, and it's hard, it, as you know, to get a consensus. I mean, when you're talking about any type of trade organization issue, be it legislation or even bylaw issues, it's, it's, it's not easy to get a consensus. So it becomes a challenge, I think a challenge to your patience to, uh, to t try to stay with it long enough to get it done because there are many times when you just want to throw up your hands because it, it's so simple you can't understand why they don't see your point of view. Sometimes in the broadcasting business we all know that the air people are public figures, that people are really interested in those. But sometimes the, uh, the general manager, uh, the, the president of the, uh, of the corporation, uh, the individual who's an industry leader is a public figure. What's, what's happened to you in that role? Well, I have a lot of jobs, but uh, you don't have a desire to be a public figure. That's, uh, that becomes a secondary issue. And, but it also creates interesting issues when you become a newsmaker because being a newsmaker and how you and how you think that you know the news media relates to you and how sometimes uncomfortable you are with what you think is the lack of fairness or the lack of balance or sometimes even the lack of truth. I think that's an interesting experience for a person who has responsibilities like mine. Uh, the, there is a fundamental obligation for everyone to do more than just what they're assigned to do. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. Someone has to do it. Someone has to move forward. It does take, uh, I would like to say, an enlightened ownership to say that that's important. Uh, and fortunately, my company thinks it is. Uh, 
what's interesting is that I have never been directed by my company to participate in any organization in any form. All the choices are mine. If I, if I choose to be uh, a, a member of the NBC board or a chairman of the NBC board, that is not my decision. So I don't know how other companies function in that regard, but uh, for us, it's, it's, it's truly a, an employee option. It's not uh, an option that is mandated by the company. You hope that if your participation is reasonable, that, that it will have a positive benefit to the company. But the choices are, and, and polls are the choices are the individual. The social responsibility in broadcasting is always kind of an interesting area to deal with, but, but you have a, a, a very well-founded sense of how the television stations or the radio stations can participate to, to improve the well, community. That, maybe that people will be interested in this in, uh, in Nebraska. We had, uh, going back a lot of years, but the, with the premiere of an, an ABC program called SOAP. Uh, and what responsibilities a broadcaster has or doesn't have uh, when it likes to preempt a program based on content. Because then you, whether you like the term or not, you become a censor for a great number of people, and they resent that. Uh, but you will fundamentally, I think, finally evolve that you are the person that sits in the chair, though, for it's your responsibility. You have to make the judgment, fully acknowledging that it's not going to have a universal endorsement. But we, in fact, did preempt episodes of soap based on program content and which is an ABC program it was an ABC network program and it was uh, in our judgment a deferral which continues to exist to today of too much authority to the program producer and it by today's standards would be tame but it's I recall it was it attacked two sacraments of the Catholic Church one with the confession and the other with the celibacy and I thought it was pushing the envelope and was interesting because during the time the programs to air, we did do a half-hour show on in prime time with all the with community representatives on the panel to discuss the role of broadcasters and what responsibilities they have in, in trying to ascertain what is or is not good for the public to see. Well, as you can imagine, that that creates its own problems, uh, but. When, you're, when the day is over, you, you need to feel that you've done the responsible thing, whether it's endorsed by a broad majority or not. So I've, I think it's fair to say I've always had the courage and my conviction to do what I think is the right thing to do. Ken, you had the opportunity on, and you mentioned as your chair of the um, NBC Affiliates Group, uh, you had the ability to react towards the network and towards the programmers. What, uh, what avenues can you remember that, uh, that those discussions have well, taken? It, it, it's... Uh, it is very. They have to be serious in that they don't press the line. I think network programming today looks at cable as a principal competitor, particularly when it presses areas of taste, and the uh, networks see that as competition. So they, they keep kind of pushing that, and then going to when we the family's children's hour or some of the things that were acceptable and unacceptable years ago now are very acceptable. Uh, it requires judgment. The standards and practices departments of the networks are, are for the most part, gone. Uh, there's just unbelievable sums of money, Larry, the day involved in over-the-air commercial broadcasting. Money is determined by the ratings. So it's a, the issue of taste and balance versus the ratings uh, becomes very significant. But I still think there are very sincere people in the business, both at the network level and at the, and at the station level, who recognize a responsibility which is broader to do what is right as well as what's the most profitable. What's, it, um, what's the difference in working for a company that's essentially a family-held based company like the Pulitzer Company and some of the companies around that you have colleagues who deal with that are open well, stock companies. We, we're, companies. we're no longer a family held company. We were a public company created on the New York Stock Exchange. When did that, that, but that's still relatively recent. Uh, 89, I think. I think it's 89. How long have the Pulitzer been in media business? For a long time. Uh, the, the founder of the company brought the Post Dispatch, I don't recall the year, but brought the Post Dispatch early on. Uh, was very, very successful. Uh, been in the media business for a long time. Uh, 
but the media business for the company. I'll go back to the corporate structure if I can. The corporate structure is uh, we are a public company traded on the New York Stock Exchange uh, with the uh, under the symbol of PTZ uh, controlled. Uh, there is a voting trust in place, which is of which I'm a member. Uh, essentially, made up of all of the family stock, and there is about 25 percent of the equity is public. But the principal owners of the company still are uh, Emily Pulitzer, Joe Pulitzer's widow, Michael Pulitzer, his half brother, and a cousin, David Moore, and the public owns the rest of the stock. So. We recognize that we're a public company in terms of our responsibility to shareholders. Uh, and it's a, a very sincere recognition because the ownership, even though it is principally family controlled, their equity is also the price of the stock. We want very much to perform at a satisfactory level for analysts. And to date, we have done very, very well in terms of the growth of the stock. I think we were up 48% last year. Uh, but it's a, a part of your life. But I also think that uh, that it's brought a positive dimension to Pulitzer in that it has brought into focus some of the, if you will, responsibilities that you have where we may, may not have paid as much attention in the past as we possibly could have. But I, I must tell you candidly that the broadcast division operates with kind of a different set of goals and objectives than the newspaper. Uh, uh, the, it is probably still hard for people who are old line newspapers to recognize that we really are in the media business and that we have more influence than they do and uh, people are looking for us to us for their information trust us more uh, but being public it's it, it has been healthy and it has been a royal pain in the neck because it is it does require very timely reporting it does require an absolute uh, accurate disclosure of your activities and uh, and they, then they put their, your salary on the front page, which that wasn't a good day either, but it was, uh, that's some of the disadvantages of being public. What was the sale price for KETV when it was sold from the Herald Corporation, if you will, sir, approximately? I think it was $9 million, I think. Uh, this is 1975. 1975, $9 million. Okay. What is the station valued as by the corporation today? Well, the corporation, uh, I'll answer that, but the if, you, if, you, if the answer is given by industry standards rather than by the corporation, Pulitzer as a company has never been a trader of assets. It's a company that makes its, its, its success is through its operations. So even though you could have a significant value with assets, it's only material if you sell them. We've never been a trader of stations and we've never been a flipper. But by all standards, uh, Des Moines, as a market, is uh, $10 million less uh, than Omaha. And the Des Moines station sold last week, uh, the NBC station sold in Des Moines for, I think, $80 million. To, uh, I think New York Times allocated $80 million. What's in that area? That sounds, uh, that, that bracket probably is one that will continue um, to change. Uh, depends. It's, uh, if the business continues to be healthy, uh, and we've had some really remarkable growth, then it's likely it could continue to escalate. But if, if the greater fool theory is applied and someone eventually gets into a position where they've overpaid uh, and you don't have someone who will come in and pay more, then that bubble could burst. None of that is a threat to Pulitzer because we've never, we'll, we will never leverage ourselves into a position uh, where one one particular issue, be it catastrophic or not, could have a, a substantial impact on the company. Sorry, got construction going on. You want to stop for a minute? Yep. Okay, I'm wrong. Over the period of time, we've talked about some things that have to do with uh, satellite television and cable television and so forth. And um, but what we want to talk about a little bit is the the track of the success of terrestrial typical television stations licensed to the community. How do you see the progression from the period that you became the general manager in, um, in 75 uh, through the corporate opportunities that you've had since that time? I think probably little change, if any, which will shock you. Uh, uh, the fact, facts are that in-market viewing of local television station is for the most part unchanged over the last 10 years. That cable 
comes to a market, um, generally will take 20, 25 percent share. The most significant issue to the commercial broadcaster over the last 10 years has been the absolutely unbelievable growth of independent television stations. So on the one hand, when they talk, when you, you, you've heard the, the discussions about network erosion, there's an assumption that that viewing has gone to cable. In fact, that's gone to an independent, which is when, when you put a, a viable option in the market, particularly a strong entertainment pro program against news, that the program is likely to be successful. And that's kind of the role that the independent stations have played. And then with the introduction of Fox, which was the fourth network, it's not a network. Uh, it, it's a... Uh, Say why you, just explain why you said that, the network is well, not a network. Well, there are lots of rules in our business, but uh, there has to be a certain level of programming in prime time in order to qualify for a network. And Fox has always stayed right beneath that number of hours of programming, when in fact it has a the same kind of distribution system and the same issues uh, that all other networks have. The reason to not be a network uh, is because of other FCC rules like the primetime access and uh, other requirements that you may or may not have. So it's uh, lots of rules applied to networks it, it, in terms of the FCC specifically, uh, which we've been working on. But there are a number of rules, and not being a network is an advantage. Fox. What's the most, well, give me your list of the most interesting technical innovations that have come about during your years in the business. Well, most probably what destroyed the business was, or came close, was the advent of videotape when people could play back what we had done the prior day. Uh, that made life interesting. And then certainly the growth of uh, the very sophisticated newsroom equipment initially beginning with the cameras that be, when we eliminated film and went to tape, the subsequent evolution of the what we call ENG or the ability to go live from all the locations, uh, and now the unbelievable technology that exists in terms of weather. We, you know, we have here what's referred to as Doppler weather. Uh, we have put a full period microwave link between Omaha and Des Moines to serve, in effect, serve the western part of Iowa. Uh, it's uh, it's been remarkable to see, and it did not look revolutionary when we did it. It looks absolutely revolutionary in today's standards. When you see the change, I mean, we're talking to a camera now that, you know, it's not about the size of a you know, dozen golf balls. When I first did, did my first remote, it took three men to wait to lift it. It was, uh, and then it didn't work. And I remember years ago when we did the first. Uh, hockey game at Exarbon, and we took these cameras out there and we lug, lug, or loaded all this junk up. And once we got there and we turned on the lights, couldn't see the ice. That was a little bit of a problem. <laughs> and so we called back and said, yeah, it's a wonderful idea. We can't see the ice. There's not enough light. Well, to end today, with today's standards, you can, you can shoot that ice rink in, uh, with, with you know, this candle around the, around the perimeter. So the technology has changed so dramatically. I think it's the advent of the computer. I mean, it's become a computer-directed or at least a, a, a digital-based business, which is in the conversion, I think, will continue. So. Over a period of years, what's the successful television station keeping up with technology like we've talked about here? How much do you have to allocate of your cash flow or your... We allocate a, That's a real tough challenge because if you look at the book value of the equipment, and, and you look at the IRS schedule for life, that gets to be a very big number. So that's not appropriate. You, you look at the real life and how it ages and how it, has to, and how it needs to be replaced. Our company's position on capital is we have and have had for a number of years a very consistent capital purchase. We'll allocate $600,000, $800,000 usually per year to a station. Some people, some operators consider capital an optional expense. Uh, I think on, to some extent it is an optional expense, but it really isn't because if you, if you delay that, then it's going to take you a long time to play catch up. But the equipment is, is terribly expensive, uh, and yet you have to have state-of-the-art equipment. When, and in our business, it's, it's impossible to do a return on investment, in my judgment, because you know, if you have to buy $400,000 in new cameras, 
you can't do a return on that because you, but you have to have cameras. So it, if that's reasonable at all, it's very difficult to do to satisfy a lot of financial people a, an adequate return on investment for broadcast equipment. So we don't do it. Uh, but it, it, it requires a level of commitment that keeps you into a, a state of the art. Uh, first, you, you want to do that. Secondly, your competitors will force you to do that. So you have to stay competitive from a technological standpoint. The real challenge today is what technology is there that we can take advantage of to take advantage of our competitors. How does the Omaha market in technology and uh, competition compare with the other markets that your company operates in? Uh, Omaha is now our smallest market in, in market zones. Uh, but the, tech, but the, the competition and the technology is as keen today as it is in any market, uh, and maybe more so. I would say Omaha is a much more competitive issue, for example, than we have in Des Moines, where in Des Moines, for the most part, it's two stations, and the third station is really not a factor. Uh, here, everyone wants to be in, in this competitive battle. Therefore, Omaha as a community is much, much better served because the efforts and energy from all the stations are going, even though the focus may be to the competition up the street across town, the fact is the public is the benefactor. You have uh, between 30 and 40 years of experience of watching Omaha television. Has it changed in terms of the competitive structure? Or has it been not in my judgment. It has not changed materially. If it's changed at all materially, it's that our station here, KETV, is, is now very much a factor in the marketplace. At the early years, we weren't a factor. Uh, and we've done a lot of things on, at KETV, going back to Mr. DeMoss and his hats and Mike May and Drag and uh, a lot of things that... Uh, Why don't you explain that a little bit? Then? That's too uh, good to pass by. Uh, Lyle DeMoss was a, a media figure in St. Louis. And, uh, in, in Omaha. In Omaha, I'm sorry, pardon me. Uh, in Omaha. And we, he, would, he would do the weather for a while. And then he had this hat deal, which never made any sense then. We had Mike May, who dressed as a woman on occasion. He was too. a weather reporter, too. He was a weather guy, too. But most of the stuff has been in weather, thank goodness. Uh, but it's been... And then we had the experience of hiring a lady from the first time we ever took a talent from another station, which created a lot of interest in town. Uh, Cheryl, remember, I don't remember this last name, Cheryl. But anyway, she came, she worked at the, uh, KM one morning and for us the afternoon, and that was an interesting day in the market. But I, I think we're now very sincere about what we're doing. It's, it's, we're well, well past the stage of gimmicks. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's why we're in town doing a news research review, which we do very on a routine basis about how the public perceives us and whether our perception is equal to theirs. And, and the public is, in my judgment, very, very well informed. They, they, they really can give you back information that is substantive, that is accurate, and they know what we do. And they can, they, you know, if we try to play games, they, they're as aware of that as we are when we do it. Talk about the, the tool of getting an audience uh, response or research in terms of well, operating In today's safety. environment, uh, you try, your initial goal is to get a very competent research company. It's all telephone type work. Uh, and it, it, in the sum is a, hopefully an attitudinal, a compre comprehensive attitudinal explanation of your perception of your station. Uh, and it's still, based on what the researchers tell us, uh, much easier to get people to participate and talk about television than any other research project. Because there's a, in, in local television, there's an ownership issue. The, in this place, the station may be owned by Pulitzer, but the community of, of Omaha thinks it's owned by Omaha. Mine, so don't you uh, do anything that you shouldn't do with it. Uh, so I would say uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's trying to make, the, like everything else you do, it's trying to make it as accurate and as representative as you can make it. So that's what makes the choice of the researcher uh, more significant. Ken, uh, except for being corporate president, what's the most fun job you've ever had in broadcasting? I think that, I, I don't want to dodge, I think they've all been fun. I mean, not always. I mean. The frustration, I think, in a job like mine is not the competitive challenges, it's the employee challenges. And it's, in my judgment, the fairness of dealing with issues that 
when it comes to staff. If, you, if something causes me concern, it will be if you're in the process of having to make a major significant personnel move. Uh, so you got to be careful with that, but you also have to acknowledge that in our experience, we've been given opportunities and patience, and we've been given, I'm certain people have provided us jobs that raised a lot of eyebrows. We now enter a position to affect that ourselves. So I, I want to be certain that we as a company do that. that we, not because it's a mandate, but we have diversity and we have growth and we have opportunities and they're hopefully equal and fair. And that sounds so idealistic, except we truly believe it. But how do you get all of this into, into the daily mix? So the fun, I guess, is winning in a real tough battle. Uh, the frustration or the worst is, uh, is when you're dealing with some significant competitive issues, not business issues. I mean, business is business. I mean, it's, but uh, you do have this, if you were, the word is control or authority over so many lives that that responsibility is, is terrific. So you sometimes have to make tough calls that I guess in our judgment would be for the broader good. But it's hard to get that understood at times, and you know, particularly when you're talking about an individual that's impacted or a station's impact. The business side, it, it's uh, it's just business. I mean, uh, what I worry about is doing the best job. I don't worry necessarily about the highest ratings. I, I think the highest ratings will represent the best job. Uh, so, so it there are obviously frustrations, but it's like any job. I guess that's why they call it work. What have we not talked about that you'd like to put on the tape for the historical purposes? Uh, nothing. For historical purposes, I'd say uh, television today is as wonderful a business as it was 30 years ago. You can get as much enjoyment in television from building the switcher or operating the camera as you can get from running the place. Uh, and the important part, I think, is to remember where you started. Okay. That's all we need. We've been talking with Ken Elkins, who has been with the Nebraska Broadcasters Association Hall of Fame. Thank you.